Highlighting the best of Cyprus and the inspiring commitment to art and culture, CultureScope shines a spotlight on the natural beauty and sheer diversity of the island, its previously hidden gems, and the people who continue to make a positive contribution to Cyprus, both locally and abroad. Hello, I'm Paul Lambus and welcome to the final episode of Season 2 of CultureScope featured on Cypress Mail's interactive web portal Good Living. Our location for this episode is the Museum of the National Struggle. Located in Nicosia, the museum is one of the island's most popular museums dedicated to the national liberation struggle against British rule from 1955 to 1959. It is one of the most important periods in Cyprus's modern history. The National Organization of Cypriot Fighters, or REOCA, was a Greek Cypriot underground organization that carried out an armed struggle to end British colonial rule in Cyprus from 1955 to 1959. The anti-colonial struggle did not result in the union of Cyprus with Greece or Enosis as most of the Greek Cypriots on the island desired. However, it did result in independence on August 16, 1960. This day, a new chapter opens up for the people of Cyprus, a period of peace and prosperity and freedom. Since 1961, the Museum of the National Struggle in Nicosia has preserved the memory of the struggle that preceded Cyprus's independence, honoring those who were killed during the conflict while serving EOCA. My name is Andreas Karios. I am a historian and uh, I am the curator of the National Struggle uh, Museum. The museum was uh, founded in 1961, only two years after the official termination of the EOCA struggle. The museum offers a beautifully preserved exhibition of photographic and video material, historical archives, artifacts and other memorabilia, shedding light on the activity and fates of the EOCA freedom fighters. Our museum is part of a network of uh, historical sites and public spaces referring to the historical period of the Oka struggle. The two most popular of such sites and spaces is, of course, our museum and uh, the imprisoned graves uh, in the central prisons of Nicosia. The imprisoned graves, located in Nicosia's central jail, is a small cemetery where 13 Eoka fighters were interred during the war for Cyprus's liberation from the United Kingdom. Nine of them were hanged by the British, three were killed in action and one died in hospital from his battle wounds. The small cemetery was the idea of Cyprus governor Sir John Harding, who did not want the funerals of the Eoka fighters to turn into anti-British demonstrations. The condemned, along with the four others who died, would be buried in the area without the presence of relatives or a priest. The tombs were built in an area adjacent to the cells of the condemned and close to the gallows where they would be executed. Evagoras Palikaridis was the youngest of the nine men who were hanged during the conflict. His conviction and execution sparked international outrage, which resulted in the abolition of the death sentences of another 26 men who had been sentenced to death by hanging. Evagoras Palikaridis' life and death made him a symbol and a role model for the youth of Cyprus during the final years of the Eoka struggle for independence, and his name continues to inspire poets and prose writers to this day. After Cyprus gained independence, the area was designated as a national monument and thousands of people visited every year. Above the buried war heroes, a sign proclaims Duandriomenuo Thanatos Thanatos Veloyete. The brave man's death is no death at all, serving as a reminder that dying for one's country 
is the ultimate badge of honor. In an exclusive interview with Culturescope, Lia Hachiavamo recalls her childhood sweetheart Evagoras Palikaridis and their relationship, which plays out like a tragic love story between a young girl and a revolutionary who stood for Cyprus's struggle for independence. I was in second year in the high school and Evagora was a year older than me. We knew each other, but from far. I was a child who loved music and I was part of the choir of the high school. One day I was coming out of the school, walking towards the house, and he stopped next to me. He was on the bicycle. He stopped next to me and he was holding some records. And I said, what is this? Records. What records? Um, it was uh, uh, the Strauss's Waltz and some other classic music. I was very impressed. That was my first um, sort of what made me, what attracted me to him. I said, I knew you were an athlete. I didn't know you loved music. Why don't you come to the choir? He says, I've got no time for that. The next time we met, he gave me a poem. It was a poem about my beautiful green eyes. And then another poem about my beautiful lips. What a romantic boy he was. But he was also, also had a, a humor. Like when he was giving me these poems, well, they are beautiful, I was saying to him. <laughs> but I can sing them to you as well. He never sang them to me. One day we had a fight and she sent me a letter, about four pages. It was like a newspaper. So beautifully written, explaining his feelings. Uh, what I meant to him, uh, how I inspired him. I made him write all these beautiful letters. There were all these beautiful poems. And uh, of course, I was getting very excited and very. Now, when I read these letters and these poems, I see how gifted he was at that age. He was only 16. He was very hurt when. I told him we were leaving Cyprus and we were going to South Africa. He was very, very, very upset and he was telling me all the time, where are you going? What would I do without you? You mean so much to me. And of course, I was feeling the same way, but it was not up to us. It was the beginning of the struggle here. It was April, beginning of April, and we left in July. He never discussed anything with me as far as being part of Eoka. The 1st of April, it was the beginning of the struggle where they put bombs in all the buildings of the English and he was wounded. Evagora jumped over a wall wire wall 
and he was wounded on the side. For about a few days, I didn't see him. And then I asked a friend of mine, and a friend of his, where is Ibagora? He said to me, I will bring him to you. So he went and he fetched him the back of the bicycle. And I saw he was run down and pale. And then, after that incident, I knew that he was part of Belka. Before the day we left, the night, we had a party at the Olympus Hotel, a goodbye, a farewell party for me. And we got there, all the friends. We danced, we sang, and everybody brought me gifts, and Evagora gave me that book with 64 poems and a letter saying to me that how he was feeling, that he cried. And uh, the next day, all my friends came to the house to say goodbye. When I got into the car, those days, there were these big, big uh, cars where they were carrying 20, 30 people in them. So he got into the car. When we started going, he was following, running after the car. We almost reached Yeroskipu, and he was still running. You remember, he was an athlete. And that was the last time I saw him. We carried on writing to each other when I went to South Africa. There were a lot of Greeks there, the Greek society. Okay, but still with us. And for us, it was very difficult to adapt, very. The Kokino Radio, the red book with the poems, I was reading it over and over and over again. At school, when it was a break, I used to sit in a corner outside and write. I still have them. I had to express myself. All that unhappiness, all that frustration. It was a must to me to get my feelings. And I was writing and they were all over all around me, watching me write in Greek. Most of the times I was writing and I was crying. And they couldn't understand why I was crying. He was telling me all the time, when are you coming? In his poems, in his letters, I was studying. And I was saying, I'm going, I want to study to be a teacher. And she was writing to me, I'm waiting for you to be my teacher. And you have to give me the best marks, whether I deserve it or not. Kiria Daskala. His sister wrote to me and said to me that She's been arrested. She kept on informing me what was going on with the court case, what was happening. She was writing to me from the jail, 
There is a letter that she says, I'm 80 percent well. Obviously, they were torturing him. And the, the letters that were arriving were all of them censored. You can see the stamp on it, censored. They were waiting for the Queen to give him a pardon, and apparently they did. She did. But they executed him midnight, minutes before they got the pardon. I used to get the paper every day. I mean, paper, paper pun, <laughs> or <laughs> until now, I can't live without my paper. And I read in the paper, Evagoras Pelicaridis was hanged midnight. The terrorists, the terrorists. And of course, I started crying. My mother ran to me when I said to her what happened. She fainted. My father arrived. Said to me, you must be proud of him. <coughs> but what I must tell you is that the night he was executed at two o'clock in the morning, I heard a big sound. And I woke up, I went to the window, I opened the curtains, and I looked out, and I saw a star passing. And I knew, I knew it was Evagora's soul. After Evagora was gone, I met Sotiri Binos, my children's father, and got married. He gave me a lot of material things. I loved him, but Evagora was never forgotten. He gave me five beautiful children. He was a very generous person. He started gambling. And after a few years, we lost everything. So I thought the only way to survive is to open up a business and rely on myself. I cannot rely anymore on this gambler who doesn't know what he's doing anymore. And with Jenny and Maro, opened the Three Sisters, which was successful. And I could give my children whatever I wanted. Independent, I divorced Thierry. So Thierry's voices came into my life, and 
When I came back, I went to the Mnimata. It was sad. There isn't one day I don't think of it. Andrea Cristanto's modeling career began a decade ago, collaborating with local and international designer labels. When not working on his modeling, Andrea indulges in acting, from theatrical performances, commercials and music videos, to television appearances and films. I was following fashion before, you know, I was reading a lot of magazines, watching other models, both local and international. I was admiring the creative part of it, you know, seeing all these uh, fashion designers coming up with these ideas. It was very exciting at the beginning, meeting all these new people, uh, starting getting projects, going into castings. It is competitive, but it's not uh, aggressive, as many people may think. Like, between other models, we have a very, very friendly relationship. We respect each other, we like each other, we learn from each other, we discuss a lot about uh, the industry, about the projects we've been. Uh, you know, it's uh, behind the scenes, let's say, it's a very friendly uh, and nice atmosphere. But of course, it's, it's a very competitive industry. Uh, many of us will go for a casting and only one or two will be able to get a job. It's true that uh, you will hear way more no's than uh, yeses. That's the nature of the industry. You, you cannot be disappointed by it. You, you need to expect it and you know, keep on going, keep on trying. I was blessed to work with a lot of local designers and brands. I've done uh, quite a few TV advertisements that I was the face of. Some video clips also from international performance as well. I was studying in England, I was coming back to Cyprus and during the summer break, I joined some uh, performance teams that were presenting uh, plays. Modeling came through my search for how to, how to further develop myself through, through this. And I found it to be um, very much linked with each other. If I am indeed influencing somebody, I'm at least I'm, I'm influencing the, uh, him for them for the better. Uh, that's that's at least what I hope to do. I would never sacrifice uh, time from the things I love. I would go for riding. It's something I particularly enjoy because it gives you another type of freedom. You're alone in the nature with the horses, which the horses are a fascinating animal. They can really sense you as well. And you do feel connected with it. And you know, it just gives you so much uh, calm, calmness and, and freedom uh, that you cannot, I, I couldn't get from anywhere, from any other, let's say, activity. My main goal in the bucket list, I must say, is, is to, to develop more in the, in the acting industry. I want to do more projects, you know. Of course, I would like uh, to travel uh, as much as possible, you know, see as much of this fascinating world as possible. Um, but yeah, this, this, these are the main things. I don't have, you know, these big dreams of, uh, of getting a big house or get big, I'm, not, I'm not focusing uh, on that. Uh, my bucket list mainly has, uh, if, if, not, if not mainly, even solely has experiences to take. Uh, as I said, you know, being, being in, project, in projects that um, make me happy uh, in acting or being in places around the world that uh, uh, can have so, so many new experiences. So yeah, th these are the main things I would like to tick off my bucket list. Emilia Papadopoulos is an internationally renowned television and radio journalist and presenter with a string of accolades under her belt. Emilia is passionate about the news and the media industry, but she is also a strong advocate for philanthropy, raising awareness for causes that are close to her heart. Emilia Papadopoulos reports. Our correspondent, Emilia Papadopoulos, reports. Emilia Papadopoulos is at uh, Sandringham Forest today and she has this update. Emilia Papadopoulos has been to take a look. 
Thanks, Riz. Yes, it's a family affair for one London football favourite. DNA testing hadn't been invented at the time of the murder. London is quite a tricky area for the Prime Minister. Extra precautions like these special barriers are already in place outside Parliament. Cases of carbon monoxide poisoning are rising. Well, this is London Bridge Station as you've never seen it before. Emilia Papadopoulos, who joins me from Limassol with more about the case. Emilia, you have carved your own path as a powerful journalist and presenter and have gained global recognition through your Work. When did you first realise that language has power and how did your passion for journalism stem out? I think that I have always been a performer ever since I was little. Um, I remember going on a school trip, I think I must have been about eight or nine at the Acropolis, holding a hairbrush and telling everybody what was going on and what used to happen here. I've always been a storyteller. You know, the way I would tell a story at home and my mum would say, stop exaggerating. I said, no, this is what happened. And it was huge and it was fantastic. And I've, I always loved telling stories. So it was a really natural thing for me to want to tell stories. I didn't know how that would, what that would look like um, later on. And when I eventually decided that I did want to do uh, journalism, it seemed like the most natural thing. And I think language has so much power. Words have so much power, the way we use them, the way we can change the world by telling stories. I think I always loved watching the news, reading the news. Um, I'd say I was a nosy child. I was always nosy, I always wanted to know why and ask questions and understand why things happened. And I think it was just a natural instinct to me to ask the questions and to always question things, um, which is quite annoying for your family and friends, um, but very handy later on. What was it like working as a senior broadcast journalist and news correspondent for the BBC? And did you aspire to work for one of the world's leading networks? There were so many times where I pinched myself. Actually, I'll be honest with you, every single time I walked through those doors at the BBC, I thought, gosh, I'm not supposed to be here. I felt grateful every single time. And I don't know if that's because I came from a small place and it seemed like something that was almost impossible. I grew up in Cyprus, I went to school here, I wasn't always sure about what I was going to do. I went to a very academic school where everybody was going to study law or medicine and those things never really came naturally to me and I didn't see other people around me that were journalists. It seemed like something that was so out of reach and it wasn't until I went to university and I started doing student radio, student TV and sort of learning about how things worked, asking those questions making change and seeing how asking questions could affect change and then thinking well what if I were to do this on a bigger scale what if I could change the way things happen by asking the right people the right questions or the wrong question I don't think I'd have the courage to do it now I think when you're young and you want something you don't have barriers you don't have boundaries you go for it I was very very lucky I had two parents that gave me so much courage and so much confidence and nothing was ever impossible. They always instilled in us that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. My mum always used to say there's no such word as can't and she meant it and I believed it. I started my career at BBC Sport and I met the sports editor there and I had no idea about sport and I learned very very quickly because I never wanted to give anyone the excuse to say she doesn't belong here. Going back to your question I think courage, it takes a lot of courage in any field, whatever you do, you have to be brave, you have to take risks because I think sometimes the best things in life come from taking risks um, and even when you make a mistake, when it doesn't work out, you learn from it and I've made so many mistakes, I was rejected from so many stations, so many networks, so many jobs um, and then when you do, when the risk does pay off, you can look back and you can understand why all those rejections and all those times that you failed. It's always for a reason and it gives you humility, it keeps you humble, uh, you remember where you came from and I think you never take anything for granted. I can't describe what it's like to come from a small place like Cyprus and even though I'm half English and even though I knew the UK, I never felt British but I never felt Cypriot. You kind of always feel a little bit of both but in London I always felt very Cypriot and I felt lonely sometimes I missed my family my parents were here London Greek radio and the people there the North London diaspora they took me on they adopted me they gave me a family 
you know, everybody. Um, I remember all of them and they were just, they gave me an opportunity. When I, when I was on the BBC, people from there would send me emails and texts, we're so proud of you, we love you, you know, you're one of us. I can't, that, that, you don't get that in every, you know, you, you don't get that in just anywhere. Those are, that's Cypriots, that's Filotimo. That is what I try to instill in, you know, in myself every day, what I will try and instill in my children, just the way we look after each other. And I think it does play a huge role in somebody becoming successful when you know there's people behind you. There's a whole community supporting you, looking out for you, happy for you, happy for your success. Um, and I can never thank them enough, London Greek Radio, for what they did for me. Looking back on your professional career, is there a moment that stands out as the most memorable? I think the most memorable, you're going to love this. I swallowed a fly live on air and it was a disaster. I cried and cried and cried. I didn't realise I was live. So I swallowed this fly that made some very strange sound. And then it cut to the presenter in the studio who was said, oh, my apologies, something's not going quite right. And I think, I didn't know the, what had happened until I had come off air. And I opened my Twitter and there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of comments. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's gone live. I thought it was the end of the world. I thought nobody would ever hire me again. And now I laugh about it. I think it was fantastic because I've taken ownership of it. It's just one of those things that had happened and it was unfortunate. And I just accepted that sometimes life just doesn't go the way that we want it to. and You can't always be perfect. Um, but in that moment, it was devastating. But then I'd say also being on the royal family's estate at Sandringham on Christmas Day, that was incredible. And I thought that day, you know, I'm, here I am from Limassol, Cyprus, standing in the Queen's garden as she and the royal family come past me to go to church. On Christmas Day, it's freezing cold. That was something really special to me. I married my husband, his business was here, our families were here, it made sense to relocate back home. Initially, I found it very difficult. You know, I was in a job where every day was different. You would wake up and you didn't know whether a bomb was gonna go off or you were gonna be on a red carpet or you'd be at a flower show. I mean, every, there was something different every day. I was functioning off adrenaline, but I was exhausted. I was worn out. You're working late nights, early mornings. It's, it's, it's difficult. And I think now, a couple of years later, it was the best decision I ever made to relocate here, to have a family here, to just slow down and take life in, especially having children here, has been a real blessing to be able to walk by the sea to have such lovely weather all the time, to not have the worries that you might have in a big city, raising children. Um, so I try and tell myself that, you know, overall it was, a, it was a great decision. What defines you and your personal brand? I don't really know what my brand was, but I, I, I guess it was always to try and be genuine and to be kind, to help people, to... I think being Cypriot was also very much part of my brand. Um, everyone used to call me Paps at the BBC. Um, but I think it was always part of my, I was always very proud every time they said my name. My father was born in the Congo and a lot of my family then moved to Uganda. Um, and we support a lot of orphanages in Kampala and just outside of Kampala. And we realized uh, that at any one time there are always girls missing from school. And it took a while to kind of get to the bottom of it and figure out that these girls were missing school for a week every month when they had their periods because they didn't have access to sanitary products. And I think the figure is, I think 500 million girls worldwide do not have access to sanitary products. So what does that mean? That means that they're missing out on key education. And so we really wanted to help make a change. And for the last uh, five years, we have started a project called Go With The Flow. My auntie, headed it all up and I help her with the fundraising and we do fundraising every single year to ensure that 800 girls have access to sanitary towels, soap and clean underwear and for it costs 15 euros a year to sponsor one girl and that means for the entire year that she will have access to sanitary towels, clean underwear and soap um, and it has changed lives because girls are going to school when they go to school they get knowledge, knowledge is power we have future doctors, teachers, 
surgeons, politicians in all those goals. We are powering on at Go With The Flow and uh, we're really, really proud of the work we've done and all the generous people. I mean, people have been incredibly generous. People are good um, and it's important to remember when life is difficult and the world is, feels like it's, you know, there are wars and pandemics and so much hardship for so many people that we need to look for those silver linings. We need to look for the good stuff because that's what keeps us smiling, right? That's what keeps us going. The, the hope of, of, a, of a good day coming up. His songs have amassed over 200 million streams and have been recorded by artists ranging from Ello Black, John Legend, to Selena Gomez and Greek pop sensation Evangelia. Jay Stoller is helping artists create and identify signature sounds ranging across many genres. I think about a lot where did music come from in my life. And there's two really clear places. One is from my uncle, who unfortunately passed away and had a really complicated life, but he was a genius savant trumpet player. The most impactful moment in some ways of my entire life. I was nine years old and they went around the room at school to ask everybody to do an audition for like the moving up play to going to sixth grade. And for me up to that point, like there were moments where I had been picked on as a kid. I didn't really like know who I was or what was my thing. And I sang and I could still feel it right now. Like the energy in the room just connected and everyone felt something and I felt something from them. And it's the only thing I've ever done since that moment <laughs> when I was nine years old. I think the most unexpected challenge of music for me is not what I thought it would be. It's not the actual music itself or writing songs or producing music. It's how much I was going to change. Like if I could go talk to the nine-year-old version of myself or 13-year-old version of myself, I don't think I would have been able to predict what was going to happen. I think the advice I would give is just remember that you love music and keep following it, but it's going to change. You'll perform, you'll write, you'll produce, you'll learn instruments from halfway across the world that you never understood, fall in love with them, change your mind, do something else, that the path of music and art is as non-linear as the creative path of discovering something through your subconscious and turning it into something meaningful. I'm consistently surprised by my ability to latch on to something and think that it's going to be the rest of my life and then watch it change right before my eyes. <laughs> Collaborating with other people and other artists is one of my favorite things to do. Some of the artists I've written with or produced for, and Aloe Black, who I work with a lot, had songs with Selena Gomez, Demi Lovato, John Legend, Carly Rae Jepsen, who I'm sure you've all heard of before too. I think I want fans to feel like my music and our music and music with Evangelia, that it is something real that came from us. Something that just feels like very true and authentic and that people can feel that we went into a deep place within ourselves in order to find something surprising. My creative process is a lot about going into subconscious places and then coming out into a conscious place. And what I mean by that, specifically I have a process where I'll wake up in the morning, meditate, and then I do something that I call a dig which is very weird um, and essentially is an improvisational movement between melodies and lyrics that will move from things that are as mundane as like, wow, I'm sitting here right now talking to Paul somewhere in Cyprus and thinking about my life. But how did I get here? How did I get here? How? How? So in starting with something simple, that's literally just like talking to the point where you can't think anymore and something comes out like, ah, that I can make a whole song out of. So I'll explore things subconsciously and like grab the thing that's really inspiring 
and now come out of that subconscious place, look at what I found and carve it out. I remember when we wrote Pame Pame with Evangelia, it was like, Evangelia, I don't speak Greek. We need a really great Greek lyric that expresses what this like music sounds like right now. And it was, and she just like went off into a corner and she's like, Pame Pame. What about Pame Pame? And I was like, yes. <laughs> Let's run with that. And then once we had that, we're able to just like develop and build and build and paint and carve it all out. But I think the most important part for me and the most exciting part is to find things that are unexpected. Like even when we were playing the arrangement of Fotia here before, those last two chords that we found where it was just like an unexpected chord with a lot of tension, home. But we never would have thought of that. We had to find that. I think so it's a process of like discovery and then obsessive, detail-oriented, unfortunate perfectionism. <laughs> Learning Buzuki has been exhilarating and I have a lot to learn. It's been really cool. I love the buzuki. There's a, some type of like Greek Cypriotness inside of my heart. If you'll all take me. <laughs> I think I want to be remembered for being a good person and kind, but creatively and artistically, that in some way I was a part of moving culture. I think about that a lot. That's one of my favorite parts about being able to be a part of Evagelia's world, is I can feel, even on a day like today, we're sitting here working with one of the most brilliant wuzuki players in the world, creating new sounds that none of us have really heard, and then translating that into recorded music that then will be played in clubs, at birthday parties, and weddings, and on the radio and to be remembered as someone who challenged themselves to create things that push the line and move culture. Located 12 kilometers from Limassol on the way to Bladris and on the northern side of the Kouris Dam, one will encounter the abandoned village of Alassa, which was relocated in the 1980s and it is a popular spot for both locals and tourists. Today, only the remnants of the Church of St. Nicholas serve as evidence of the existence of a village which until 1980 flourished by the banks of the Kouris River. From year to year and from season to season, the reservoir's water levels change, as does the image of the church. The Cyprus Rugby Federation works constantly to develop and promote rugby in Cyprus. Its aim is to get the sport played in every school, town and community across the island. Costandinos, the success of our national rugby team has set the tone for a long and bright future in the sport. Is the process of establishing and promoting rugby as a good product a challenging one, especially in a country where rugby isn't a popular sport? I think you hit the nail on the head a little bit there with rugby not really being a popular sport. The amount of times when I'm explaining that, oh, I like rugby, I'm involved in rugby in Cyprus, and people sort of respond with, oh, that's the sport with the stick. Or is that the one where they're wearing all the pads that we've seen on television? So there's a bit of an education process which needs to you know, that we're trying to achieve. So the biggest challenge that we're trying to take on is the marketing side. We've been very fortunate to have um, a marketing team join us and have really helped with our social media presence, our search engine optimization and all this side of things where we've never had that before. Finally sorted out our website and a few other things. That is one of the really 
good point for us over the last couple of years to have that exposure now. But what we really find difficult, which I'm sure all sports find difficult, um, is of course finances, especially after what's happened over the couple of, last couple of years where there's been a loss of interest as well in sports in general because of everybody's been locked up inside. Something that we've focused on over the last few years, our relationship with um, Goa and Goe, the Cyprus Sports Association and Olympic Committee, to really start identifying what, because we are part of those associations, so we really wanted to identify what it is that they want from us. And we were very privileged to have um, Mr. Andreas Mikhailidis visit our last game. And he said some very positive and heartfelt things, which made us, you know, blow up, if you like, which was lovely. So um, it is nice to start seeing it being recognised from the Cypriot community. When rugby started in Cyprus initially, it was sort of run by the British bases, uh, as well as the cricket. And then it moved over and we became a federation under COA. So um, Cyprus Rugby's registered office, if you like, is at the Cyprus Olympic Committee. We're a bit more budget than some of the other sports because we just want to grow it. So we don't want people paying us to um, coach kids and come in after school and so on. We just want to grow the sport, uh, want to give back to the community. That's our main sort of focus. There's always a bit of banter between rugby and football. So I'm not going to say anything about football, but I've always felt that there's much more of a community family feel around a rugby environment. And to show those values um, and the discipline and respect that people can learn throughout rugby, they need to come and try it. They need to not just come and do one training session, you know. So it is an education thing, but I think once people come down and they see the family environment around Cyprus rugby and every team um, uh, across Cyprus, it's a very attractive thing. Tell us about the national team and the people who are working behind the scenes to ensure the Federation's ongoing success. As Cypriot started returning from South Africa and the UK and so on, especially South Africa actually, that's where the core of Cyprus rugby started actually, the Cypriot South African base. So it's all about the Cypriots have gone off to become expats and of the diaspora and so on and come back. And they started up a team, Paphos Tigers, uh, who are still going to this day and still very strong and still winning the league very often, which pains me because I'm a Limassol Crusader at heart. They joined the British Bases team and then the British Bases were running the league. And in order for us to establish ourselves and become a federation, we had to come under Goa. And that's where Cyprus Rugby started, we made our first international team, and we came under COA um, in order to start the league. Um, then Limassol was the next team to join, the Limassol Crusaders. Then the Nicosia Barbarians started up, who are now the Nicosia Titans. And the, most, the, the newest team is the Larnaca Spartans, who just celebrated their five-year anniversary. The Cyprus Rugby team is made up of some players who play here on Ireland. Our standard here in Cyprus is reasonable, but it's still very social. And it's very good that we do have the British bases because they do help us pick our level up and we get a lot of touring teams come and play us to assist the, the growth on Ireland and the competition on Ireland and give those better players something to strive for and focus on the international development. But the core of our player base is Cypriot to the diaspora in the UK and Scotland. We don't quite have the budget yet to look at flying players from South Africa and Australia. I think if we did, it would be amazing. We'd go up a couple of levels, but that's something that we look at in the future, maybe. So our core player base comes even for home games from the UK, um, which is great because there's a big Cypriot community in the UK. So to have that contact with the Cypriot community in the UK, and we actually have committee members in the UK as well, based there to assist with the marketing efforts in the UK and the development of rugby in Cyprus in the UK as well. So it's sort of two arms to it. I give credit to a lot of the, the past presidents, uh, it's Lukis, Johnny, Lavrendios. I've really followed in their footsteps. They put lots of effort uh, and work in to get us to where we are today and give me the foundations to be able to try and take it on. And hopefully do my part for Cyprus Rugby as well. What is your vision for the future of the Cyprus Rugby Federation? After one international game uh, in November 2019, which was a win against Malta, it was our 50th game, 
was a big win for us because um, Malta's a really good team. Covid hit and then I've been pretty quiet, <laughs> holding the reins, trying to keep us uh, afloat. What we've always found with Cyprus Rugby is that when everybody comes together it's more of an event, as you can imagine, you know, that it brings more buzz, more people come to watch because it's more of, of an all-day thing. We can intersect the, the senior games with youth games and what we're trying to achieve this year for the first time is um, we've achieved it already. We've already played a couple of ladies games but want to make that more of a, um, an every tournament thing so that ladies, youth, senior, males are all playing together on the same days and made a big event which attracts a lot of numbers and attention and excitement. We have a, a nice um, set of committee members now who are all active and I think that's something I really wanted to achieve when I came into the committee. I, I love having as many people around to help because we're all volunteers so we don't want to overburden anyone and I think in the past people have been a bit overburdened. Um, so to be able to bring in a committee and just have everybody doing what they're good at um, and not overburdening anyone. Um, I don't care if we have a hundred people on the committee. You know, if everybody has their role, we'll be able to develop quicker and if everybody does their job, so it's great. Does the national team have a motto or creed that strongly influences the way it functions? Our motto is Idania Bidas, um, which means come back with your shield or upon it. When Spartans used to go to war, um, they would bring back those that died at war on their shields. Um, and if you'd won, you'd come back with your shield. So that's where it's sort of come from. And if you'd run away, because you couldn't run away because your shield was too heavy, you'd drop your shield. So you don't come back at all. Um, and that's where it sort of comes from. And that is something that we try to live by, I suppose, a little bit. We're very much involved with uh, a few charities. And what I'd really like to do is show that we're here as a rugby at the heart of a community. That's what I'd really like to put out there and have it as a base for every city or community within the city um, and grow from there. Be able to go into schools and bring them into a, a family from different schools coming to a family together as a club and providing a hub where there is support for one another. Um, I mean us as a squad I know we've given each other financial support when people have been down and out, um, you know, social support and so on. There's a huge family feel. So what I'd really like is to be able to give back to the community by growing the sport, if you like. So getting into schools, showing them what rugby is about, uh, growing from grassroots up and being able to make a big culture around rugby. John Turvey arrived in Cyprus in the late 1950s, eager to share his knowledge as a teacher at a time when British colonial policies were affecting and influencing the island's educational system. John, you arrived in Cyprus in the late 1950s. What motivated you to become a teacher and eventually set foot on Aphrodite's island? I came out of university uh, with not very much idea of what to do really and um, I did a bit of teaching in England not very much but uh, it seemed to me quite a good life and I quite enjoyed it. And the 1950s in England was a pretty dreary place you know um, it was almost as if the war was still going on. When a job came up in Cyprus although it was the so-called emergency, which I prefer to call the insurgency, we came out and it was very interesting, I think. We come to Limassol and there was no harbour. It was just a roadstead where ships anchored and if you had a car on board, and lots of people did, they would see their cars hoisted up over the bare sea <laughs> for a few agonising moments before being dropped into a lighter I remember the drive to Nicosia and it was, um, I remember being struck by two things. The, the very narrow strip of asphalt, which was then the main road, which meant that two cars could not pass on the asphalt. So it was a game of chicken as to who <laughs> yielded first, you know. And then there were loads of 
women working on the roads doing quite heavy manual work. I was taken to the office to meet the head of Turkish education, a man who spoke the most beautiful English. Um, and um, he told me that I was going to be sent off to Paphos to be head of the English department there. Um, I, <laughs> Paphos was then very remote. The point about Paphos is that it was very small. 6,000 people lived in Katima and practically nobody down at the port. It was three-fifths Greek Cypriot and two-fifths Turkish. We were, because my wife was also employed at that time, the first English English teacher that they had ever had. We lived totally in the Turkish community. We were honorary Turks. And at that time, 57 or so, it was not EOCA policy to upset the Turks. So we were protected, in a way, for a large part of our time by being, as I say, honorary Turks. The only Greeks we ever managed to talk to were people in government service who were always pleasant and kind. But um, Cyprus was held on to by Britain very largely for um, strategic purposes, I think. Shelley House, your residence at the time, was given a new lease of life when Buffalo served as European Capital of Culture in 2017. Do you have any memories that come flooding back while living in one of Buffalo's most iconic and historic buildings? Well, for a long time we were living in, in a hotel there where they tried to find a house for us, you know. There was no question at the beginning of our living in the Chile house. It was too grand for us. <laughs> we were pretty low in the colonial pecking order, let us say. Dr. Shelley um, had a good reputation in Cyprus. He, he, um, he died before we got there, uh, but he distinguished himself in his efforts during the Paphos earthquake, you know, um, Strong B was the epicenter. But he had perhaps overdone things during his work in the earthquake and he died of a heart attack. There was a Greek um, doctor and his wife who moved into the, um, into the house. But they only lasted one month uh, because the doctor's wife kept seeing Dr. Shelley. It was haunted. Some people laugh at this because, you know, they don't believe in ghosts. I believe in ghosts because as a child and as a teenager, I lived in a haunted house too, and I, I knew what it was like. So we went to live in the Shelley house, and um, uh, it was a lovely house. What were the influences and consequences of British colonial policies on education? The colonial government um, was only fully in control of the Turkish side of education. It was in control of um, primary and secondary schools. But when it came to Greek schools, um, the colonial government was not in control of secondary education. The secondary schools on both sides were obviously channels for a great deal of political influence. The Turkish teachers from Turkey, they were obviously there to feed a certain amount of um, pro-Turkish sort of um, attitudes, you know. What were your most memorable teaching moments? One of the most striking and <laughs> memorable moments in my life at the school was one day uh, there was a big demonstration, a Turkish demonstration, probably Turks against Turks in this respect. I used to teach some of my uh, kids in a little house, the other side of the football field, detached. I got a lot of very young kids, about well, 12 years old and so on, and they were doing their stuff, you know. And um, meanwhile, there was a big demonstration outside the main school and uh, they were getting very worked up um, and um, Turks when they get worked up 
are a pretty fearsome. <laughs> I looked out of the window of my little place. Coming to Mars was a mob of Turks, just like that. Mob coming towards me and my little class. Uh, actually, I wasn't frightened because I knew that whoever they were against, it wasn't against me. But rather foolishly, I locked the door. <laughs> they came in through the windows. They poured in through the windows. They picked up the students, these 12 year olds, carried them out and went on. They just wanted more manpower or girl power, whatever, for their, um, for their demo. It was one of my most memorable moments, yes. How does John Turvey want to be remembered in the history books? I would just like to feel that, um, that they remember you as a good bloke. I must have um, influenced some lives, as a teacher one does, in ways that one doesn't realise at the time. I'm always struck by the fact that uh, people come up to me sometimes and say, yes, I remember you saying this. I have no recollection of saying this. It doesn't sound like me even, but um, it... Uh, <laughs> It obviously had some effect on them, I hope good, but I, I, I do, um, I'm always very pleased to meet old students, you know, and um, they're always pleased to see me. <laughs> but one always has to struggle sometimes to be absolutely scrupulously fair. I sometimes feel that in some cases my attempts uh, to be fair um, didn't always have good effects, you know, but I think one still has to be fair, you know, and um, uh, there it is. <laughs> when you were here before, couldn't look you in the eye, you look like an angel. Your skin makes me cry You float like a feather In a beautiful world You're so very special I wish I was special but I'm a creep. Music became a part of my life at five years old. Mum and Dad pulled me into a music school and I was learning how to play piano. And I loved it. Every term they had a vocal at Stedford's where, you know, you could get up there, everyone sings the same song and, and you go up and sing and, uh, you know, the winner gets, gets a trophy. I went up there, I sang, um, I won. It was amazing. Like, uh, it was just such an amazing feeling, you know, being on the stage. I was so young. And then I was sitting there with the trophy in my hands and all excited. And, and uh, ever since then, I just, I love music. I love singing. And then I transitioned from piano lessons to singing lessons been singing my entire life and uh, yeah it's just it all started at five years old and ever since that day ever since I started doing that it's just been full steam ahead I love it when I'm not around you're so very special I wish I was special Captured effortlessly, that's the way it was. Happened so naturally, did not know it was love. Next thing I felt was you holding me close. What was I gonna do? Looking back at it now, it was a fantastic experience and I learned so much. I do think I was too young, but I value all the experiences that I had on the show and the people that I met and you know they, they mean a lot to me and, and everything's kind of tied into now you know everything builds up into one for me just continuously doing music and doing what I love so yeah X Factor was just something that I'd always wanted to do and I'm really grateful that I that I did what I did and and here we are now. There's many artists that have influenced me. I always looked up to Michael Jackson when I was young. I just thought his presence and what he did musically was just amazing. 
I really love The Weeknd, Bruno Mars is fantastic, um, a lot of Eurovision acts are amazing and I also uh, really look up to people like Hans Zimmer, um, you know, and, and people that make beautiful music in movies and games and, and that epic cinematic sound is something that I'm, I'm quite obsessed with. Uh, but at the same time, you know, music from Europe, Greek music, um, you know, Arabic, I listen to so many different styles of music and they've all influenced who I am as well because ever since I was young, you know, I would listen to Greek music with mom and dad and with the family and at weddings and everything and, you know, I would say to, to my dad, I'd be like, you know, I just, there's something about Greek music, I don't understand what they're saying, but I love it, I can only understand little parts here and there and I currently have a Greek teacher, I'm trying to learn how to speak Greek now very important to me but my dad always told me he goes this music's in your blood Andrew and um, and I totally agree it just is and that's why in a lot of the songs I create there's I like I like emotionally driven vocal I find that's a lot, that's the case with a lot of Greek music um, you know it's something that just has that that meaning to it with that darkness of the cinematic sound so so many different things that kind of tie in together to create you know, all my influences, if that makes sense. The song is about meeting someone in your life that just makes you feel amazing, you know, makes you feel like you have a superpower um, and makes you feel electric, you know, like this new emotion running through your veins and, you know, that, that makes you want to jump out of your skin. That's what the song's about. My ultimate goal for this song would obviously be to release different versions in different languages. I need to do a Greek version, you know, these are all the things that are, that are in my head. I am quite a simple person, you know. I really enjoy, it doesn't take moving mountains to entertain me or to impress me. I think the most important thing for me is being by the people I love. That That's my favorite thing. But if I want to be left alone, you'll find me in my room. <laughs> I'll be in my room, you know, playing games or watching a movie or something. But, you know, I don't want to sound cliche or anything, but honestly, Paul, I'm the type of person that I like to get an ice cream and just walk along the beach or something, that makes me happy. Go for a walk, play basketball, I love sport, I love watching sport, you know, basketball is something where I clear my mind. So you'll either find me at the beach, in my room, or on a basketball court, or at your yard's house. <laughs> I want to live with you, even when we go, cause you're always there for me when I needed you most. I would love to collaborate with other Greek artists and, and I would love to tour Cyprus. This is all stuff that's been on my bucket list since I was five. I'm telling you, I'm not even lying, you know? So I wrote this song for you. Now everybody knows that it's just you and me until we grow old. Sometimes I just sit down and say, you know what? Things happen for a reason. Just take it day by day. And, and that's a motto that I live by. Quite religiously, I must say. As our second season of Culture Scope comes to a close, we would like to thank our audiences in Cyprus and around the world for their overwhelming support. If you want to be featured on Culture Scope, contact our production team by visiting the website below. Until season three, stay safe and let culture transform your life.